Should we give Sam a break or have him do marathon sessions? Um, in case anybody's wondering, we did coordinate last night. I brought out my denim, my denim blue suit. Um, this panel is really about paradoxes. Uh, consumers want their food from local farms, um, local areas, yet it has to be at scale because there's such huge demands. So that's kind of the broad thought that we're going to explore with this great group. And, and I do want to start at the farm. So Anna, talk about your journey and, and what you've done. Sure. Well, uh, Doug and I became beginning farmers at the age of 40. Um, we both had two careers. Doug grew up on a farm in Ohio and uh, lost it in the crisis of the 80s. So we've been on this journey to stand up our own farm. So at the age of 40, with uh, no debt other than our house, excellent credit, long work records in agriculture, we went to USDA and used all the beginning farmer loans and purchased 1,280 acres off the open market in north central Montana, 40 miles from the nearest town <laughs> and in a very remote part of the country. Today we're at 5,000 acres. We have an apprentice program where we're trying to incubate other new organic um, farmers. Um, and I think it's really important that you think and get to dig a little deeper in the soil that's beyond just the window outside your, your place. Um, how many of you eat Annie's mac and cheese? We're, we're one of the Durham growers for that product. So behind what's on your plate is a whole lot of other awesome faces and places um, that are outside of your, outside of your purview. Mm -hmm. um, rural America, there's a lot of opportunity out there. And you've done organic farming, but again, at scale. Yeah. How have you done that? Oh, organic has been part of our solution. Um, we started organic from the very beginning. And because of organic, the market um, is growing. I think uh, some statistics I've heard is over half of our organic grains are imported into the U.S. So the demand is totally outstripping the ability of us to grow it. Um, the market is so wonderful because you can have direct relationships with your buyers. I can tell you where a lot of our products end up. We get to have risk sharing discussions around our contracting process that just doesn't happen in the commodity market. Um, and then we also have some really great partnerships with conservation agencies too. Our farm is, uh, if you look at it from Google Maps, it's laid out in a really different um, way than our neighbors that are for the most part a wheat fallow system, block farming. We're in strips um, and we have conservation strips in between our crop strips, partners with Xerces Society, so we're doing a lot of pollinator habitat. Um, the organic market's growing. and. The demand's unmet, and it's a huge opportunity for anyone that wants to become a farmer. That's great. Let's turn to you, Randy. Um, I confess I've seen you shift in your seat a couple of times during the panels over the last <laughs> day and a half. Um, some of the perceptions that are out there about large farms. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Well, we do. Uh, as uh, the organization U.S. Farmers and Ranches Alliance, we really work to represent all of agriculture, we work to do that very hard. There are misperceptions about how food is grown and raised, and a lot of that's related to size. And um, sometimes big gets, uh, gets kind of a bad deal uh, in media or in the communications about agriculture as a whole. And we try to help people understand that, that though farmers across this country are, uh, are using GMOs, obviously uh, on millions and millions of acres, and and pesticides are used and, and used precisely and fertilizers are used uh, in ways using technology that we've never had before. The way that, you know, the way that we can plant soybeans, I, I love to tell the story of my 85-year-old father sitting in a tractor and, and not using his hands to plant, to steer the tractor and, and what you can do um, around precise use of these products and what GMOs actually mean to some farmers and ranchers across the country and oftentimes I think and even here uh, yesterday you it can kind of get a bad rap and it's very very important technology and farmers though the average age is 59 years there's there's young farmers nearly behind every farmer so if you look at USDA my dad is on our farm at 85 years of age but there's people behind him in our family and that's really the case with with every farm uh, that I know of that that uh, particularly of size, is that it's kind of, it is oftentimes a corporation to protect itself, 
uh, and it can be a corporation if it's 500 acres or 5,000 acres. So we really try to work with, with groups and all of you here to help you better understand how we grow and raise food and not to have some of the methods that farmers and ranchers use today demonized in order to make the point to drive other production practices. Right. It does seem that so much of food marketing now, I mean, you go into a supermarket and everything is about what the food doesn't have. Right. right. Non place. this, non this, right. gluten free water. I mean, um, <laughs> there's, you know, everything's the devil that this particular food doesn't have. So, how does that translate down to it, the farm? It is impactful, and we all see that everywhere, whether it's um, a restaurant promoting um, hormone free turkey or poultry, when in fact we don't use hormones in poultry or pork. Um, you know, those things, they do sometimes feel like it can give the consumer kind of a bad image of how we grow and raise food. And so that's something we're working to overcome. We're trying to work as an industry, we're trying to take the farmer's voice out to food companies and have conversations with those organizations and, and even individuals. We made a, we, we launched a film called Farmland a couple of years ago that really works to try to communicate with consumers and food companies about you know the, the things that maybe are being miscommunicated. The absence claims, I, I think right now food marketers would tell you the way to get people to buy their their product is to put an absence claim on it. And we see so much of that and oftentimes that that particular ingredient or GMO or gluten free isn't even part of that product. Right. So it's a little bit of misinformation. Right. Have you seen examples and that come to mind that really make your head explode or well, I, I suppose oftentimes it's the it's the the uh, hormone use in in poultry. That's probably the one that's the most challenging when when it, people are looking and are concerned about those those uses to begin with. Um, you know, seeing GMO free lettuce when there is no GMO lettuce, right? So, um, yeah, those kind of make your head explode. I, we we have a report that somebody is marketing GMO free water, and you know what is that? And, and it really does feel like it's right. just a way to demonize some of the technologies that we're using that really help us be sustainable. GMOs are a great way to, to move toward conservation or no tillage. It's a great way to reduce the use of pesticides. Mm -hmm. It's a great tool for production agriculture. Hmm. Let's turn to you, Nick. Uh, the name of this panel is Farm to Really Big Table, and you've done that uh, with Sweet Green. Um, I was telling you, Sweet Green just opened a place across from my apartment building in New York. There was a line outside. It seems 24 hours a day. So how do you do that? I mean, you, the company is growing so quickly, yet you use local products. I mean, it must be a logistical nightmare. It is a logistical challenge, but I mean, from the beginning, when we started Sweet Green nine years ago, it started as just a solution to a problem. You know, my two partners and I, Jonathan and Nate, we just had nowhere to eat in college that fit our values, that made us feel good, that really spoke to us, so we wanted to build one. And at, from the beginning, we never really conformed to typical economic models or typical ways of buying food or really understanding how everyone else did it. I think we tried to learn as much as we could, but for us, it was really trying to build a different kind of food company and understanding that that transparency, that connection to the food was everything. And so for us, we knew that we could only be successful if we could build successful relationships and long-term partnerships with growers and producers. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? You go into a new market, what's the process? Do you open the store and then get the farmers or how does that work? Yeah, so the way our supply chain is set up is it's actually quite regional. Mm -hmm. So every city is set up as a separate supply chain. And for us that allows us to really spend time learning and understanding each region, each community, each um, network of farmers and producers and growers and understand how Sweetgreen fits in there and then how to adapt Sweetgreen to that community. Mm -hmm. So even though what we've created is a chain and a lot of people hate to use that word, um, we kind of celebrate that because we're a chain that has really taken this food ethos and tried to scale it. And that ethos is that we believe that food should look and taste different in every part of the country because that's how it grows. And it's not about having a standard menu or a standard flavor, everything being exactly the same. It's about really honoring the soil and the farmers. Right. So every single city has a different supply chain and thus a different menu that changes seasonally. 
So for us, when we decide to go to a new city, um, we kind of make this joke internally that we almost meet landlords, uh, farmers before we meet landlords. Mm -hmm. So when we decide to go to a new city, for us, it's just as much about finding and meeting and learning from the farmers as it is finding real estate. Mm -hmm. And do the farmers truck their stuff to your stores every day? I mean, do you have all those, how do you, how do you make that work? Yes, yeah, so this is where the logistics come into play. And I think, you know, we've seen this be easier in certain cities than others, but in general, we spend the year before opening a restaurant in a new city, connecting with the farmers and growers and understanding what do they want to grow, you know, what is their soil need, what makes sense in that region, what is indigenous to the soil, and really all these inputs to understand how to build our menu. Mm -hmm. And when we have that, we build the menu and then we try to plan a year out with them, contract certain things or understand and commit to buying certain volume of those ingredients so they know that, okay, you know, this part of my farm is planted and already bought and Sweet Green's gonna buy that. And then, then the tough part really becomes distribution. Um, so we work with really um, a local produce distributor in every city that becomes, has to become an incredibly close partner. Right. So even though we buy from all these incredible farmers, what we don't want is to have 12 or 15 trucks showing up at our restaurants every day. Yeah. A, because it's not good for our restaurants, it's not good for the footprint, and it's quite frankly not good for the farmers. When we have 20, 30 restaurants in a city, you know, they don't want to be delivering to 20, 30 restaurants a day. Right. So we really rely on this partner to, with their optimized routing, to pick up from all of our partners and we get one truck to the restaurant every day. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of coordination there, obviously, and that's what our supply chain team focus, focuses on quite a bit. Right. But once you've set that up and once you've built this relationship with the farmer and producer and we can build that trust, then it's really fun to just build on the relationship and continue to buy season after season. Right. Arlen, what's your take on this, this issue of sustainability and what we're eating? Well, I think the question of what we're eating or really um, what we're served is the key to sustainability. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk a lot about sustainability and whether it's, you know, maintaining our ability to drink water, breathe air, and eat enough food, um, or whether it's about restoring um, the biodiversity and the habitat and, you know, bringing back the little Eden like we're in, in, in stone barns by how we choose to, to polyculture and polycrop. You know, all of that is on, is on the supply side. And while Nick's been very thoughtful about matching what grows or the terroir and flavor of a place with what's on the menu, a lot of uh, the big restaurant companies and the big grocery stores said, here's the products we offer you. And you can try and grow them better. But, um, you know, with all, all due respect to what GMOs do for us, you're never going to get a chicken to have the water footprint of a carrot. Or uh, you're never gonna you know, get animals to look like plants instead of their, their environmental footprint. And so what we choose to eat and in what amounts is really the driver of sustainability. It's, it's what's on the menu. And I think the really interesting thing and why there is this dichotomy is while so many of us are caring more and more about what's, what we're eating, where it comes from, how it's grown, what's in it or not in it, we're also making the decision to have businesses and culinary professionals make more, more of those choices. And going back about you know, 40 years now, we've been spending more and more of our consumer food dollars to hire a company to decide what ingredients go on the plate and in what proportions and portions. Last year, for the first time, the USDA told us that we spent more than half our food dollars in this country on meals away from home, prepared by restaurant and hospitality and food service companies, and less than half in the grocery store. With grocery stores getting into the prepared foods business, um, we heard Kroger didn't do it so well yesterday, but many are, are really, that's their, their main engine of growth. We probably spent more than half our food dollars hiring a business to figure out the recipe and the sourcing for us mm -hmm. back in 2008, mm -hmm. and less than half on buying ingredients to cook at home. So I think what those companies are doing is the key to sustainability. Um, and whether we choose to eat a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that, because that's what's growing this year, that's what reflects water availability, that's what reflects growing conditions, that's the key to sustainability. Uh, Martha before us talked a lot about, you know, people are going to plant-centric or plant-forward diets. And that's something that, um, you know, I brought to the table back about a decade ago at Sodexo is our key to, uh, to sustainability. And now, you know, Nick and I work on an initiative with the CIA and Harvard to get more plant forward uh, menus into higher volume food service called Menus of Change. And, um, you know, that's all great that that's now. But what's interesting to me is that going back about 15 to 20 years, there's been a direct correlation between us eating out more and us eating less red meat. Hmm. Lots of drivers were concerned about our health, animal welfare, 
and also businesses want to make money, and it's mm -hmm. cheaper to not serve that stuff in these big portions. Right. So I think some of the menu shifts that we're not noticing are also what's driving sustainability in the food mm -hmm. system. And how do you change consumer tastes? I mean, well, you know, I think it's about bending tastes or leading tastes, or you know, my firm changing tastes. Um, you know, if you think about some of the biggest changes in our food industry, they did not come from the consumer. Um, I think about 30 years ago or 20 years ago, people were not lining up at restaurant at, at grocery stores or or restaurants and saying, "Darn it." I want to have five kinds of lettuce on my salad plate, not just one. That was something a chef came up with. Right. Um, no one, although it's in decline now, suddenly said, you know, oh my god, um, people are fainting from dehydration on the streets, therefore we need the bottled water industry. Right. Um, I, for one, did not really want pork to become a white meat. I'm happy with it being red and a little tastier. <laughs> All of these things were brought to us, right. and I think the intersection has been what's good for our health and what a chef wants to serve us. And then we see that trickle down from mixed greens in the high-end restaurant to more restaurants to the $3 billion bagged salad industry. Um, and that's how change occurs. Um, I think right now we're looking for sufficiently yummy and we're making the shift through the generations from healthier for us to um, having uh, food that uh, expresses care, care for people, care for animals, care for the planet. And we have the ability to, to lead that. Um, the place where we're playing the most, though, I think right now, is that the nutrition advice needs to change a little bit. We have been trained to be incredibly scared of two or three macronutrient categories. And if we were going to try and increase sales for Annie's mac and cheese, uh, I don't know how many of us would eat more of it. Maybe we'll do a show of hands if I told you it had more fat in it. One person. Which fat? Two. Yeah, three. How about if we had more carbs and more protein? Yeah, because that's the one macronutrient we're not afraid of, but that's the one that has the biggest environmental footprint when we eat it. And so if we can get around you know, saying we need more and more and more protein until we need the right amount of protein, I think that's a big sustainability move. Restaurants are getting there by taking certain kinds of animal protein off the plate and replacing it with plants. Um, we did a study with the uh, Center for Prevention and Research at the Stanford Medical School, and you know we looked at what people were eating both at Stanford University and in the U.S. in, in general. And um, you know basically, um, most of us are eating a, a little bit more protein than we'd need each day if we wanted to be an NBA, uh, an NFL linebacker. <laughs> and about twice what the average adult needs. And what's right. interesting, at least according to official figures in China, uh, they're right there with us. Hmm. So we, we eat a lot of protein because we're scared of the other stuff. Right. Maybe we could make coffee a fourth macronutrient or wine. <laughs> um, but getting that old nutrition template out, I think will help us think about what's on the plate, not what's right. on the center of the plate, what's delicious, yeah. uh, not how much can we get. That's great. And back to Anna, I want to ask you, as you were growing your farm, what were some of the biggest challenges you encountered of taking it to scale while also staying true to mm -hmm. organic techniques? What were yeah. some things that surprised you, you didn't expect? So I, I don't know so much that there was an issue of ever staying true to organic, that system, because Doug and I were committed to that from day one, and that has been a solution for us. Um, I think what has been most striking to me in our journey is how little people really understand about farming. I think it used, used to be that um, all of us are two to three, maybe four generations removed from an agricultural background. America used to be significantly agriculture. Anyone know how much, how many, what percent of the population is farmers today in the US? It's like 2%. And, and so trying to not only um, grow an organic business that has a very different uh, production system and a very different income cash flow um, tabulation and you explain that to bankers and loan officers that that was probably one of the ch biggest challenges right. Right. Um, I think also just having people understand what it means to grow food Doug and I both worked off-farm jobs I still have one 
Um, it provides the health insurance for us. Uh, but after year four, he was able to leave his job and farm full time. So mm -hmm. I feel like we've had a really good success story, but that's we've had to be really innovative and a different um, approach to the system of growing, growing a farm. But we see such opportunity there, and it's really fun to talk to our neighbors who are more conventional, and they're really curious. And um, we have excellent working relationships with some of them. There's one that has a small feedlot that brings his cattle in off the range in the winter, and we use that manure to help up the phosphorus on a part of the farm that we need. So we have these really great symbiotic relationships. So while it may seem like there's this, um, mm -hmm. You know, yin and yang out in the food system discussions. Really, when you get down to it and you're working with your neighbors and each other and you can sit down and talk about it, um, it's a really different experience. I think that's such an important point that farmers in general, many farmers that are organic producers may also grow conventional mm -hmm. or use other technologies. And, and oftentimes, in, in the, wherever it's, it's framed up as it's farmer against farmer, and it's not. Uh, we, are, we actually are about 1% of the U.S. population, a little less now. And it's really important to, to know that, that we're not battling each other. Often food companies do. Food companies kind of create that image that it's, uh, you know, yin and yang or, or the versus thing, which can be very powerful yeah. in marketing. It can. But, you know, we, we just have to keep in mind as we go to scale and congratulations mm -hmm. on your farm. And I think a lot of people are looking hard at how to diversify farms always. We have been on a, a path of continuous improvement for generations. The, the reality, though, is, you know, yesterday in our tour here, we went out to the, to the garden and the tomatoes, rows of tomatoes, and, and they went out and handpicked tomato budworms mm -hmm. off the tomatoes. There's 500,000 acres of tomatoes in this country. We're not going to go handpick the pests off of all those acres. So there, we have to look at other um, remedies for this. And, and some of it's organic. Some of it's the ecosystem that you can create. Mm -hmm. And some of it's some other tools that we have in agriculture that we can make use of uh, that really do help us produce a food supply that's plentiful and nutritious and safe. Right. Well, what are, go ahead. Ch changing systems is, is really, really difficult. And there's a lot of takes time, companies in the organic world that are talking about transition. And what does it take to transition and support farmers transitioning? It's uh, three years without prohibited right. substances. And I, there's a huge interest in that. Um, the challenge is, is you have to change your mindset and your way. It's not off farm inputs. And you also have to change your heart in a bit. And those are really culturally embedded, challenging questions that each farmer has to ask themselves. Um, and I think to the point of the tomato pests, it's, it, it, what I took out of that is it's actually they ended up with other pests coming in and eating the tomato Absolutely. pests because they have a seven year rotation and we have a seven or six year rotation on our farm depending on the location. So to have a rotation is really a different way of thinking about what do you grow, what market are you going to sell it to, oh my gosh, I'm going to grow things in these strips that we have that we're going to plow under and not have a cash crop out of. To, to have a more conventionally, chemically high input yeah. farmer shift to that, it doesn't happen overnight. But it's also so important to understand we have beneficials in insects in all of our crops. I mean, it, 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 it doesn't just happen just because of an ecosystem or because of what, you know, there's so much talk here at Stone Barns about the soil. We, we work across this country as farmers. Every farmer is interested in their soil and keeping their soil healthy and doing mm -hmm. the things that make it healthy. And it's, it's part of our lifeblood. It's who we are. It's what creates our, our being and our, and, our, and our farm. And we, we focus um, so much time on that. And it, these aren't the best soils. These aren't the, the only soils that can grow these incredible varieties of wheat that you can grow on your farm and we can grow in Kansas. It, it, farming is a very, very broad business, and farmers, there's, there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of farmers across the country that do it so well and are so focused on sustainability and on, and on keeping their farm for the next generation. Yeah. And I think that gets lost in some of these conversations that it has to be local. When my, when my family steps out on their front porch, you know, we, we have 4,000 people at the most in our county. There's enough beef to produce or to feed 10,000 people. So we can't market just locally. 
that's not the answer. Yeah. I think Go ahead. there's one more piece, though, that I think we need to start unpacking as a society that really is going to have a culture around food. Um, and if it is only 1% of our population as farmers, I, fi I find that really sad. And I, I'm reflecting on the discussion yesterday with uh, Dr. Ornish and Bernard from Kaiser. And I think Dr. Ornish made some comment about, well, everyone that's a doctor is telling their kids to not go be doctors because it's a really tough job. You don't have good hours. There's you know, alcohol, drugs, depression, because you're doing all these things. Well, we've spent generations in the US telling our kids to not farm right. and, We're also and, and our land grant universities are responding to that and so part of the call is is how do we make farming one of the most amazing entrepreneurial exciting innovative things you could do right. um, and that that brings money back to our rural economies we, Doug and I had one graduate student do a quick study um, and, and just in six years of us bringing a new operation to a county that we didn't grow up in and have any impact, any connections, we brought over a million dollars to the economic value of that yeah. county. So. And you, you jumped into this um, as a mid-career shift. So I am curious, what, over the course of a typical week, what is your favorite part of the farming oh. life? And what is the least favorite is part? The week or the, the year? <laughs> Give us some uh, insight. Uh, well, I think at the beginning of the year, it's, all, it's always fun because you're like the planning and what's coming and, oh, wow, we got moisture. It's going to be good. We have new apprentices coming on. And then, you know, then you get into the work. And this is what's fascinating about hosting young people on our farm right. is, oh, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I don't go to the coffee shop every day. And 14 hours, what, we're not eating till 10 o'clock at night? No, Mother Nature says you should be out seeding and we're gonna seed until right. Mother Nature says. So that, that, there's always a lull in the middle of the season that's tough. Yeah, I could. And then at the end of the season, you kind of like, oh wow, you can see the end of the tunnel. You're like, harvest is coming in. It actually was a good year. And some of that depends on the year. Last year we had two inches of rain. Um, and our, we're in an ecosystem that only gets 11 annually. So we only had two during the growing season. It was terrible. Yeah. So. You know, these policies also that support our farmers. Yeah. Um, we could do a whole nother show on <laughs> crop insurance. <laughs> Arlen, you want to jump in. Well, I was just going to say, you know, one of the things that I think is, is different, you know, we're, uh, we're only a 200 and some year old country. Right. I remember I was uh, having dinner with someone in, in Turkey and they said, where would you take me to in the US? And I said, Independence Hall, I grew up in Philadelphia. What's that billion? And then they you went on and said, my house is 800 years old. Oh. Um, yeah, that's true. You know, we, um, we really, you know, with all um, the way that, that our, our, our country grew through waves and waves of immigration, which continue on, we, uh, we're still working on what's our food culture. And so many other places develop the food culture and the farming culture together which is why the, the terroir or the flavors of a place fit yeah. together with the menu of the place or the cooking traditions of the place. And we simply don't have that. And I think we're really wrestling uh, with, you know, we have up until very recently really focused on food as a quick convenient and a solo activity in many ways. You know, we, we tried the family thing, then we did the solo thing, then we did the eating in our car thing. Um, and so I think, you know, the Is that over? Is that one over? I think it's over. I, I hope think so. it's over. <laughs> um, I had a, you know, when my last car came without a hibachi right. grill attachment right. for the heater vent, I think it was over. <laughs> um, but I think we're now starting to come together around, you know, there's certain things that happen when we eat together. And that's the start of us building a food culture. We certainly know we're in a global world, it's a quest for global flavors. Um, and in that way, I think, you know, we want flavors that change a lot. Yeah. We're, we're an impatient eating culture that came from eating alone in our car. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why people are also, you know, pushing the local piece, but actually meaning something different, mm -hmm. you know. You've seen the claims in restaurants that have nothing else to offer, that at least the food is locally served. Yeah. Yeah, we can feel good about that. <laughs> Whatever that but, <laughs> It also speaks to the ingredients not being a single commodity devoid of flavor variation. You know where you're painting the flavor onto the boneless, skinless chicken breast, or maybe the reason why some of the meat analogs aren't quite going the way they want is because it's the same flavor over and over again and you have to paint it on. I know Nick's doing great work mixing flavors constantly with the seasons. I think people are looking for those variations that continue to surprise and delight us. And that's where the culture's going now. 
plus eating together a little bit more. So we need the farming to produce different flavors throughout the year and throughout the country. That doesn't mean that farms that are 1,000 to or 10,000 acres don't have a place, but we need to differentiate what is unique about um, you know, the rye that may grow in the Midwest with the rye that may grow in the plains and how those things come apart. Um, the bourbon industry has done this very well through storytelling, but it's all commodity corn. Right. Um, if we're not liquored up, we really need the food to speak of the place a little bit more. That's great. Great enough. Before we go to questions, I just want to ask Nick, um, we had a fascinating panel yesterday about the chef entrepreneur where they were talking about margins and making the business work. Um, in terms of your business model of making farm to table work, you've decided not to sell soda in your restaurants. So walk us through the the business thinking behind that? Yeah, so I think from the beginning we really tried to not conform to the normal economic model of fast food, which does rely pretty heavily on soda profits. And even if you do back of napkin calculations, a really big chunk of a restaurant's or fast casual's profits can really come from soda. Um, from the beginning, we didn't believe that wasn't part of our ethos and we didn't want to serve it. And so we were forced to really build a model to be profitable business that didn't involve that. And that meant keeping the menu very simple. It meant keeping the labor model simple. Um, even though we do everything from scratch in every restaurant, it really forced us to make certain decisions around what we could serve, how we could prep things, um, how we could build our restaurants, to really be able to build a model that is sustainable and profitable and that can scale. And so for us, we don't rely on those sort of profits. And because we didn't have them in at an early age, it's part of our DNA, it's not, there's no pressure for us to add that because um, we've been able to figure out a way to build a business that is profitable without that. And you see so many of these big companies trying to improve their, um, their ingredients or their sourcing, and, and you know, we really respect that. But it's tough for them because so many of their models are, are built and rely on things like soda profit. And there's probably some of the largest restaurant groups out there that would love to get rid of soda philosophically, but the reality is they can't. And so I think when we look at how we started our business, we had this very strong ethos and core beliefs, and we've tried to you know, make that even stronger as we've grown so that we can build that into the DNA of the company and, and build a profitable model without things like soda. And you guys make the drinks yourself. We do, so all of our drinks are uh, cold brewed or brewed in-house. It's really water-based infusions, agua frescas, no refined sugar, all made in-house every day. And again, the margins are pretty high on those also because they are water-based. But there is this connection to um, the ingredients, whether it's the organic tea leaves or the blueberries we're blending into the blueberry agrofesca. But at the end of the day, it's, it pairs the best with our food, and it makes our guests feel the best when they drink it. We truly believe the best thing to eat with a healthy meal is a glass of water. So if we can flavor some of the water and add some cool flavors to the menu, um, it creates this great situation where the customer is winning, the business is winning, and you know, the whole community is winning. That's great. Questions from the audience? In the back, please, with the white sweater. Um, hi, this question is for Nick on a comment that Anna had about effectively making farming sexy again and trying to get young, innovative entrepreneurs into the business. Um, given how closely you know, local farming is tied to your business, I guess, do you feel any kind of responsibility or see an opportunity to do anything within Sweet Greens or through partnerships to, to bring young minds into farming? It's a great question, and I think one of the things that we've been most excited to see in the industry in the past nine years since we've been open is the farmers have really become somewhat the rock stars and it's who we can celebrate and guests and customers really want to connect and be connected to where their food comes from. So for us, whether it's listing every farmer in each restaurant on, on a board, which we do, so that customers can see that transparency, to really also going deeper and telling, you know, we produce a lot of content around our best growers and producers and really explain some of the why, um, the purpose and the why is behind our decision of why we're working with this farmer, what they're doing to their soil, why we pick this ingredient, you know, why we source Hubbard squash in Boston versus butternut squash in another city, or why we decided to start buying broccoli leaf from our broccoli farmer to support his business, but also to introduce a cool new ingredient. So we definitely see ourselves as having a big responsibility to tell those stories to celebrate the farmer and really because we are so consumer facing and we interact with you know, tens of thousands of guests a day, we really see it as our responsibility to celebrate the farmer and the product. Well, and we were having this really cool conversation about the contracting process and how can that be more transparent so that we don't have these adversarial relationships between farmers and the rest of the supply chain, but like mm -hmm. partnerships and what are we doing? Exactly. Great. Time for one more question. 
thank you. Um, a question I have, you know, we've talked a lot about consumers being confused, and I will admit there's so much <clears throat> out there that's being thrown at consumers from influencers. How do you feel as influencers to that conversation, whether it's media, uh, chef influencers, or as, as leaders in brands and marketing? You know, what's our role? I hear a lot at this conference that Organic equals healthy and good, and conventional is bad and shameful. And conventional farmers have done a lot in innovation. They are progressing, and it is healthy. But the consumer now doesn't know, and it's messed up. We know that to scale um, and for food security that all farms matter. So how do we make sure the conversation doesn't just shift to organic? That's not sustainable in my mind. And consumers are really messed up at the end of the day in terms of knowing what choices and feeling bad about the food they're eating. Right. That feels like a Randy question. We, we, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we refer to everybody in this room as a super influencer. You guys are here because you're so engaged in food and in the food movement, and you're looking to be so much more involved. And we, we feel we've been in this uh, conference now for three years in a row, and, and we're very proud to be here this year. We're not a sponsor, but we're so proud to be a part of it and to have the opportunity to speak to people like you. And we need to we need to go to the tens of thousands of you and actually have you understand and go to the content online that helps you understand how we treat animals, why we confine animals, why why a pork chop and a chicken just tastes a little better than a carrot. You know, those kinds of you know, Talk to and, Dan. Uh, and what we did, <laughs> I tasted that carrot two years ago. I, I can't do it again. But the, 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 the reality is that um, we, have a, we have an uphill battle, really. And, and we want to do it in dialogue. We want to do venues like this to where you're hearing every side of this discussion. We can't just be out there alone talking to you folks. You have to hear our story. And unless we're listening to you, you won't listen to us. And that's a big part of how we go forward. That's great. Great stories, great insights. Thank you, everybody on the panel, for. <laughs>